Well, welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director, um, and I welcome you to this special conversation with labor journalist and author Steve Greenhouse and his new book, uh, Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. Um, our format uh, is to invite three individuals to read Steve's book and bring their own perspectives to bear in a conversation with him. And those three individuals are uh, Shireen Horazuk, who's president of AFSCME Local 3800 um, and an officer of AFSCME Council 5. Uh, Erica Schatzlein, uh, who is past vice president in the St. Paul Federation of Educators and is currently an English language learner teacher at the elementary level here on the east side of St. Paul, or virtually. Um, and our third participant is uh, Javier Mario Alisea, past president of SEIU Local 26, uh, historian. I, I tell people, once you've been a historian, you never stop. Uh, so Javier is a historian, once my colleague at McAllister College, um, and is currently a fellow at Rutgers University uh, working on a project about bargaining for the common good. Um, so all three of these individuals have experiences and insights that connect very directly with Steve's work and Steve's book. For those of you listening, I want you to consider typing in questions and comments through the chat function or the comment function on our Facebook page or our YouTube page. Um, we're hopeful that to try to make this as interactive uh, in these difficult circumstances and times, uh, as interactive as we possibly can. So uh, we're gonna start this program with Steve providing us, for those of you who have not yet read his book, um, a summary of the book, which does not excuse you from reading it. It's, it's a teaser. Um, and then maybe a little more thinking about the relationship between his arguments in that book and where we find ourselves in October of 2020. Steve? Thank you, Peter. I'm really thrilled to be doing this and thrilled that the Eastside Freedom Library has organized this event to discuss my book. I thank you, Peter. I thank Shireen. I thank Erica. I thank Javier. I look forward to this discussion and questions, no matter how tough. So Peter asked me to begin by discussing why I spent four years of my life writing this book. First, I believe that far too many Americans, especially young Americans, know far too little about labor unions and what they've achieved for tens of millions of American workers and their families. Accomplishments like the 40-hour work week, safer workplaces, employer-sponsored health care and retirement plans. There's much truth to the bumper sticker unions, the folks who brought you the weekend. A second reason I wrote the book was I wanted to sound an alarm about a problem that too few Americans understand or pay attention to. And that problem is worker power in the US has grown far too weak. Part of this is of course the decline in union membership to just 10.3% of American workers are in unions. It's down from 35% in the 1950s. This decline in worker power has unfortunately hurt our nation in many ways. It's fueled wage stagnation, and income inequality, and it's helped enable corporations and billionaire donors to gain undue sway over our politics and our policy making. A third reason I wrote this book is to sound an alarm on another huge problem. Uh, too, too often American workers aren't treated with basic dignity and aren't given fundamental protections. Just look at how essential workers are treated so miserably at many places during the pandemic, whether at McDonald's or many Amazon warehouses. Um, speaking about a lack of dignity and fundamental protections, the U.S. is the only industrial nation that doesn't have national laws guaranteeing all workers parental leave or paid sick days. The U.S. is also the only industrial nation that doesn't guarantee workers any vacation, paid or unpaid. In the European Union's 27 nations, all workers are guaranteed at least four weeks paid vacation. What a difference. There's an important aspect of what I call America's anti-worker exceptionalism. The U.S. is the only industrial nation, uh, as Bernie Sanders keeps telling us, is the only industrial nation that doesn't have universal health coverage. We're the only industrial country where, 
500 workers and their families can lose their health coverage merely because the employer, their employer closed their factory. Because so many Americans don't know how worker power was once built in the US and don't know how unions lifted tens of millions of American workers, in my book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, I explore some important labor history about some of our greatest worker struggles and victories. Far too many young people think that the 40 hour work week was handed down by God. I explain, no, it was won by decades of worker struggle. I write about the great uprising of the 20,000 female garment workers in 1909, a courageous two month struggle to fight for a 52 hour work week and they won a 52 hour work week. I write about the great Flint sit down strike, probably the most important uh, strike of the 20th century. And with that huge victory, um, that really got the ball rolling in a big way to unionize millions of workers in the United States. I write about the Memphis sanitation worker strike in 1968, which was a, a usually important strike in helping African-American workers uh, be treated with dignity and get some semblance of, of, of equality at work. Unfortunately, the great uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated while he was in Memphis helping the workers. The middle section of my book is about the decline of worker power beginning in the 1970s and how that has hurt uh, workers and the nation at large. I discussed the many reasons why worker power has, has happened, the, why, why the decline in worker power has happened from globaliz globalization to trade agreements to Ronald Reagan's busting the air traffic controllers union to corporate America's fierce, zealous anti-unionism to corporate America's obsessions obsession with maximizing profits. And I have a chapter on Scott Walker's war against Wisconsin's public sector unions. And the last third of the book, a more upbeat section, I examine models and strategies for how to build or rebuild working power, worker power. I write about the fight for 15 and how it's gotten uh, eight states to enact laws uh, for a $15 minimum wage. I write about the coalition of Mockley workers in Florida, which has done a marvelous job raising pay and working, uh, and, and working conditions for about 30, 40, 50,000 farm workers in Florida. I write about the great St. Paul Federation of Educators, which is a model union in terms of working with the community so that labor and parents and students work together to all lift themselves up together. I write about the teacher strikes in West Virginia, Oklahoma, and Arizona where, you know, which was so important in, in, in workers and teachers showing their flexing their muscle and standing up to the conservative austerity um, consensus of, you know, austerity and cuts in, in education spending and freezes and teacher salaries. And those were such important heroic strikes. So, you know, I finished writing the book uh, early last year. So a lot has happened in labor since then. Uh, on one hand, there have been some really good signs for workers and for unions. You know, the Gallup poll, which came out last month, said that the public approval rating for unions in the U.S. is 65 percent. That's the highest level in 17 years, and it's tied with the highest level in the past 50 years. So Americans like unions and they want unions. The other good news is that the age group that most approves of unions is the 18 to 34 age group. 71% of them approve of unions. That's a very good sign for organizers and for unions. Another hopeful sign, there's a big MIT study uh, that found that one in two non-union Americans workers would vote to unionize if they could. That's up from one in three in the 1990s. So that's a big improvement. And we've seen a surge of impressive innovative worker centers and worker groups like Tool in the Twin Cities, the Coalition of Mockley Workers, Make the Road in New York, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, um, and, and the Workers' Defense Project in Austin. There have been so many great, impressive worker centers. We've also seen a promising surge of unionization in numerous fields. Adjunct professors, nurses, cannabis store workers, grad students, digital and print journalists, museum workers, nonprofit employees, even at the famously anti-union Chicago Tribune and LA Times. There's a tilt towards organizing a lot of white collar workers. We have to do better organizing blue collar and lower, lower wage workers. And, and just last week, 1,800 nurses at HCA Hospital in, in Asheville, North Carolina, unionized one of the biggest union victories in the South in decades. Also over the past uh, year or two, we've seen a surge of strikes. The Marriott strike, the GM strike, 
the stop and shop strike, the Los Angeles teacher strike, Chicago teacher strike, even 20,000 Google workers went on strike to protest how usually the company's management has mishandled sexual harassment cases. So uh, strike activity has surged in 2018 and 19. In 2018, 485,200 workers uh, went on strike. That's a 20-fold increase from the year before. That's the largest strike surge since the 1980s. And believe it or not, in 2019, even more workers went on strike than 2018. So we're seeing a real restiveness, a real energy, a real frustration among workers, indeed among tens of millions of Americans. We're also seeing this energy, this frust frustration with the massive Black Lives Matter protests, with the women's movement and Me Too activists, with immigrant rights and DACA activists, with climate activists, with March of Our Lives gun control activists, with the Poor People's Campaign, with the Fight for 15. I keep wondering, how can all these movements, you know, how can we get them to feed each other, fuel each other, help each other grow and to remake and rebuild America? Americans are tired of festering injustice. They're tired of stag stagnating wages. They're tired of racial injustice. They're tired of increased income inequality. So all this was bubbling up when the pandemic hit early this year. And as we saw the shabby way that so many employers treated their essential workers trained a very harsh spotlight on how broken and callous the American capitalist system can be. Workers at several McDonald's in LA and San Jose said they weren't given masks or gloves or hand sanitizer, not even soap in the bathroom to wash their hands. At some Amazon warehouses, there are only one or two hand sanitizer dispensers for 4,000 workers. At Smithfield's cheek by jowl pork processing plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 100 workers contracted COVID-19, an unconscionable, hard to imagine number. As millions of well-paid white collar workers work safely from home, many low paid essential workers continued reporting to work at supermarkets, pharmacies, Amazon warehouses, fast food restaurants. And I found it unconscionable that many of their employers did not give these brave essential workers any hazard pay. So not surprisingly, during the pandemic, we saw many worker protests because workers were fed up with how they were being mistreated, treated without dignity. We saw protests and strikes at McDonald's, Amazon, Target, Instacart, Whole Foods, Uber, Wayfair, meatpacking plants, Trader Joe's, nurses at some hospitals, sanitation workers in Pittsburgh and New Orleans, University of Michigan grad students. And now in recent weeks, we've seen teachers at several districts around the nation walk out or have sick outs because they're scared that um, school districts are not making conditions safe enough. I interviewed uh, recently Andrea Dellendorf, um, one of the smartest organizers I know. She helped run our Walmart and now helps run the organization United for Respect, which helps retail workers. And Andrea told me, What's been happening to working people in this country is like a frog in boiling water, where, there have been, where there's been this slow burn of declining stability and worker voice. The coronavirus crisis turned up the heat and exposed just how unconscionably corporations treat workers in a way that working people are not going to accept again. That, she says, creates fertile ground for a larger movement. On one hand, the huge unemployment numbers and the growing poverty and hunger are making many workers angrier and more militant. But on the other hand, the huge precariousness, the huge job security at work, the fears caused by uh, COVID-19 are making uh, some workers more scared to speak up. And during all this, you know, what we're seeing, you know, we're seeing some of America's mightiest corporations grow nervous about workers standing up and flexing their muscles. Amazon went out of its way to signal that, that it won't tolerate worker organizing. The company fired Christian Smalls, the courageous worker who spearheaded a walkout over COVID-19 safety at Amazon's warehouse in Staten Island. Not stopping there, Amazon, Amazon fired Bashir Mohammed, the lead worker activist at a, at a Minnesota warehouse. Amazon also fired two courageous tech workers in Seattle who were outspoken uh, climate activists, and, and they also had criticized safety conditions at Amazon's warehouses. Whole Foods, an Amazon subsidiary, has created a heat map that uses 25 metrics to keep tabs on which of its stores are most at risk of union activity. Uh, Trader Joe's CEO sent an anti-union letter to all employees saying, 
Unions were a greedy third party that only wanted their money. And all this came after Google fired four worker leaders who were promoting collective action against sexual harassment and other problems. Uh, American companies aren't playing beanbag. Many are serious about wanting to crush unions and silence workers who have the temerity to speak up. In my book, I, I explain that corporations in the US are far, far more anti-union and aggressively anti-union than, than corporations in any other industrial nation. And then the Trump administration has pissed all over the idea of greater worker power. It's NLRB, you know, Trump's NLRB is the most anti-union in history, much more anti-union than Reagan's. Trump's, uh, Trump, the Trump administration is pushing to make it hard for Uber, Uber or Lyft drivers or many janitors to be considered employees rather than independent, con rather than independent contractors. The Trump administration uh, has made it harder for uh, companies to be considered joint employers, making it harder to unionize. It's appointed judges who lets companies prohibit workers from bringing class actions. Uh, the Trump NLRB has even allowed corporations to prohibit workers from using the internal corporate email to discuss unions or working conditions. So generally we see two powerful cross currents. Workers are angry, workers are speaking up, workers are growing more militant, workers want more power and fairer conditions. But corporate America and Donald Trump and many Republicans in Congress are doing everything they can to beat back unions and suppress worker power. That's the theme of my book. That's our big fight. We need to increase worker power. We need to increase worker voice. We need to do that to build a fairer economy and a fairer society. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm, I muted myself. Uh, so, uh, Erica, would you like to pick up and, uh, and, and talk about your perspective from within the St. Paul Federation of Educators and the network of unions that they are also involved with, please? Sure. So I am one of those workers uh, who has more recently been on strike. Actually, the St. Paul Federation of Educators uh, was on strike in March, just as the COVID pandemic started unfolding. Um, and so that's, that's in our recent experience. But um, I greatly appreciated this book as I am probably one of those young people that you referenced who doesn't necessarily believe that the 40 hour work week came from God, but I definitely didn't understand the history to the depth that I feel I need to um, from you know how much I learned from this book. And there were a few things that really struck me um, with really strong parallels to the work we do at the St. Paul Federation of Educators. So um, as, as referenced, uh, we, work very closely with parents and community organizations and really value our work with SayTool and other um, workers' rights organizations across the Twin Cities because we know that workers are our parents and that a rising boat or a rising tide uh, lifts all boats. And so we know that when the janitors across the Twin Cities um, started winning the fight for 15, that that put more food on the table at our families' houses and lowered the stress level for our students. Um, and our strike in 2020, our number one issue was mental health supports for our students. Um, because for so many of the reasons um, that Steve cut discussed with income inequality and the loss of worker power across the country that has a direct effect on our students and our families that we work to serve. Um, one of the things that really struck me in the book is um, our core value at the St. Paul Federation of Educators is bargaining for the common good and knowing that our contract is a document that defines our working conditions, but that our working conditions are our students' learning conditions, um, and that the two go hand in hand. Um, and being a, a younger organizer and leader, I knew that we at the St. Paul Federation of Educators are taking a lot of lessons learned from the Chicago Teachers Union 
But what I didn't know is like the UAW leaders after World War II and uh, Walter Ruther, who, you know, and now it's 60 years ago, um, they said in the book, he rejected the cash register approach alone and always argued that labor should seek to build a better world, which if that isn't bargaining for the common good, I don't know what is. So um, I, I think that I will be endorsing this book to all of my union members um, just to really build that depth of understanding with the labor movement and how it really is a river that started at the beginning of the country and still continues and is needed with just as much, um, it has just as much importance as it did then. Thank I just you. respond very quickly to Erica, 30 sure, seconds. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, thank you, Erica. Thanks for the kind words. So uh, in my book, you know, I could have written about, you know, hundreds of unions and union locals around the nation. I only write in detail about two union locals, the Great Culinary Workers Union in Las Vegas has done such a spectacular job raising pay and benefits for thousands of hotel housekeepers and dishwashers. And then the other union I really focused on, Modern Day Union, is the St. Paul Federation of Educators because your union does has done such a great job in bargaining for the common good to show we're not just trying to get that extra nickel in the envelope to, to use Walter Ruther's phrase. But you know, yes, we want raises, but at least important, we want mental health professionals, we want more librarians, we want more nurses, we want smaller class sizes. And and I, you know, decided to write about your union. And then I was in St. Paul and I met you there and I appreciate your help because it, it's really such an exemplary union in pushing for this idea of bargaining for the common good, which really helps unions, you know, in their weakened state, develop strength and leverage by uh, developing alliances with, uh, with folks in the community. Thank you. Um, let's turn to Shireen Horzuk again from AFSCME Local 3800. Um, we could spend a whole program talking about the wonderful ways that 3800 is organized from using birthday parties and other social gatherings to organize a far flung workforce, the enormous physical plant of the University of Minnesota and a union that has been very outspoken and progressive on issues of police brutality, issues of foreign policy and imperialism. Uh, Local 3800 has been quite a leader and Shireen's been a big part of that. So Shireen, please. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this event today. And thank you, Stephen, for your book. I, there were a lot of really interesting points that you raised um, and lessons to be drawn from it as well. So I really appreciated it. And you just mentioned the culinary workers and um, as well as SPFE. And, and those were actually two of the sections that I most appreciated in terms of the drilling down into exactly how that organizing happened and how um, how workers built power um, within both of those organizations. Uh, a couple of points that I was thinking about as I read the book um, and or back and forth between reading it and listening to it um, uh, as I was walking. Uh, one was just um, uh, you stress the, uh, the role that legislation and policies and union practices um, uh, play in terms of the decline in organizing within labor and that there have been so many attacks on that. And I think um, my thought is that I, I agree that it's really important, um, the attacks on organizing, but I think that the uh, even more important are the attacks on worker militancy and uh, that has uh, prevented many unions from standing up and fighting back. And so, so that began with Taft-Hartley and rolling back and making illegal worker actions that built that solidarity and a sense of like, we're fighting not just for ourselves, but for everybody. And those things included, you know, some of it's the sit down strikes, um, slow down, secondary strikes and boycotts, the use of permanent replacements, like all of those things um, uh, were put in place because uh, because strikes were so successful. The sit-down strike was incredibly successful, so they made it illegal, right? Uh, secondary boycotts, um, secondary strikes were successful, so they made it illegal. And I think that any discussion about, um, about changes in legislation um, needs to also look at legislation to, to push the boundaries on that. 
fortunately, I think unions, and, and you lay this out, um, uh, uh, the best examples are unions that kind of push back on that and rather than saying we're going to let the limits of the law dictate how we're going to organize, we're going to actually organize and say you're going to have to find a way to stop us otherwise, right? So, um, you know, I think there's a, I can't remember who the quote is, um, but the there is no illegal strike, there's just an unsuccessful strike. Um, and we see that whether it was like the Republic Windows and Doors sit down strike that was, um, that they got away with even though it was illegal. Um, whether it's the teachers, you know, the red for red strikes in states where it was illegal to strike um, or striking over issues of um, class sizes, which are not legal in many places, right? And so I think that, that, um, that a part of it is that unions have not only allowed the law to set the limits of our organizing, but we've allowed the law to set the limits of our, um, of our actions as well. And um, the other thought that I had was just as it relates to, again, worker militancy and the need for, uh, or the, um, the role that upsurges have played in building the labor movement, right? And we talk about the, the, you know, coming out of the UAW strikes and how there was just this massive wave of organizing that happened. There was also a massive wave in the public sector um, that happened in the 60s and that that was out of the civil rights, um, the gains of the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and really saw like the teachers unions um, uh, just kind of massively organizing. That was where we saw Memphis and you talked about that in your book and um, and if people don't know much about the history of the sanitation um, workers in Memphis, I just encourage you to read everything that you can about it because it's one of the most inspiring um, battles, I think. Um, but and, and Ask Me Battle, too. Yes, and Ask Me Battle as well. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we... Uh, it was, uh, I, I look at it two ways. I think it's, a, it's an amazing battle that, that was an AFSCME me battle, but I think that a lot of times the labor movement um, looks at and wears as a badge of honor, and AFSCME does this as well as a badge of honor that Dr. King was there supporting our strike. And so then we use a lot of quotations from Dr. King or talk about that legacy, but then we don't look at what the significance of it was that the civil rights movement put all of their effort into supporting a labor battle. And yet um, the labor movement fails, I think, especially today in putting all of our resources into supporting the civil rights battles that are there. And that was the kind of the, the last point that I was going to raise that, you know, Janice and the attacks on the public sector are really a concerted attack on the gains of the civil rights movement. Um, and the, the ability of unions to bring um, predominantly, um, especially, especially African Americans in the African American community um, into a kind of middle class um, status in terms of wages. And we've seen just a rollback on that. And I don't think there's enough framing of that of the um, attacks on public sector unions as being attacks on um, the gains of the civil rights movement and and that that's a significant thing. Um, and finally, just that I think we need to do better as a labor movement in um, in really putting all of our boots on the ground in support of the movements of the the current civil rights movement in in the movement um, against police brutality and the movement against police crimes. And I think that that labor overall has been too hesitant in doing so. Um, and I think it's confused with the idea of, well, what about police unions, right? And in, instead of saying, well, wait, wait a minute, I'll, if you talk to any, anyone um, who is talking to their members, if you have African American members, if you have BIPOC members, there are people who have suffered repression at the hands of the police in whatever union, whatever city you're at. And I think that we think about this as, a, as an issue that is outside of the labor movement versus a, a deeply felt um, issue that our members are facing on a daily basis. And therefore we need to take a stand um, to support our members in this fight. And, and that's something that, that we've worked really hard at um, within our unions. And we see like the best of the best of unions um, nationally are doing that today, right? That's the Chicago Teachers Union, I think it has really led the way 
um, in that the University of Illinois um, in Chicago, there were just 5,400 workers who were out on strike, um, uh, strike for our lives that really um, looked at well as well at kind of tying in the issues of civil rights, tying in COVID, tying in police repression and, and, um, and bringing all of that together. And I think um, those are some real lessons that we can learn. Thank you, Shireen. Um, our third commentator uh, is Javier Murillo Alisea, past president of SEIU Local 26. Um, I would say, you know, in the decade plus that I was able to watch Local 26 under Javier's leadership, it transformed itself from a kind of narrow business union uh, into a social movement union and uh, a union that many of us now look to, uh, to learn how to deal with the very kinds of issues that both Erica and Shireen have brought up. So Javier, please. Thank you, Peter. And uh, just thanks so much for being invited into this conversation. I really appreciate it and really appreciated Stephen, the, your, your book. And um, the first reflection that I had on it was just wanted to appreciate the focus on story and storytelling. Um, because uh, it, it was it was striking uh, to me for uh, for many reasons, but um, including that I think that we in the movement and in movement work um, do not I think um, uh, do do not pay the kind of attention to story and storytelling that we should. That it is it it's, it is itself movement building, um, and I think that um, we often are on the left armed with. Kind of facts and figures, um, and the right um, is armed with arguments that hit people in the gut, and um, and and the gut will always win. And that is not to say we can we can both be right on the facts and figures, and deliver a story that that truly like move, moves people. And so I just loved how much the book was filled with uh, with stories of individuals and organizations but of, and of meetings and just think that just very vivid portraits of how these things actually uh, happen when i when i first started working um uh in the labor movement and i would um i'd go to uh to you know hear labor speeches and and this is sort of my my second point of striking the um that strikes me about the book is i feel like the labor movement we are often very eloquent about all the things that have been done to us. Like we, we, we can recite all of the laws, all of the, uh, all of the corporate attacks, all of the things that have been done to us, which are all extremely important and we should know those things. But um, we don't, uh, I would hear labor leaders speak and that would be the sole focus. And there wasn't a bright sort of story, a vision of the future, a vision of either the past that was empowering or for the future. And I would just listen to these speeches and think, well, who wants to join your movement? Like, you know, it's, it's a, it, it just sounds really depressing. You lose all the time and, and you're, you're, and you, you keep getting beaten. And so, um, so I, I think those things are, are related. And I think in the, in the, the things that we do well, um, that we have done well, um, the, at the, and that uh, Erica and, and Shireen both have, uh, spoke to was worker militancy was that was strikes you know the, the to me that was the 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 um, the, the big lesson and you know my years leading local 26 is that getting um, uh, when, when people decide to put it all on the line that there is there is something so deeply movement building and so deeply or like institution building outside of the win on the contract but actually uh, you know, um, getting over that hurdle of uh, of, of fear um, is just so important, and we simply win bigger when we are uh, militant. Um, I, you know, personally learned that when, as a uh, as a new leader of uh, Local 26, went down to to the to Houston as an as an ally of the janitor strike in 2006, and uh, was arrested uh, there and spent 36 hours in the Houston city jail, and um, because they were. They were not playing there. They, we were, our, our demonstration was trampled by horses. And it was, it was super, it, it was a, a crazy intense experience. But for me, it, it, um, it just highlighted. And since it was at the beginning of my career as a, as a labor leader, um, 
it, I carried with me all those years the power of that moment of what we ask ourselves of ourselves and what we ask of workers to when we when we're they're putting it we're putting it all on the uh, on the line. Um, so, so that the kind of what we're doing well, I think those are important stories. What we've done well, are important stories to talk about. And then, but then, what have we looking internally? Um, I, I've uh, as, as someone, I think partly because I had been an academic and kind of like I have an unusual career as a labor leader, um, I kind of always, uh, I, I tried to maintain um, a, a, a perspective of looking on the, from the outside looking in, of trying to, you know, and, and looking, but also looking internally at what can we do better. Um, and and uh, one of the things that I wanted to sort of ask you about in terms of like just the more, the more recent history of the labor movement, I feel like one of the ways in which we have failed is that if you look at the labor movement today, uh, it is still organized, like institutionally, along the lines of an economy that I would say that largely does not exist anymore. So, you know, the AFL-CIO, like, and, you know, the sort of the big story of the, of the 20th century labor movement of, you know, trade of, of the um, industrial unionism versus craft unionism kind of coming together, that, like that, that, is a, that is an important story, but, but the story of today's economy and that so while while those attacks from corporations and everything have gone on um, uh, were happening, we also have an economy that is fundamentally transformed. And so um, Andrew Dellendorf, who you mentioned, who works with United for Respect and the whole worker center world to me today reflects a worker movement that is focused on the contingent workforces that are the economy today. Right, and that that is, and that is not simply about low wage. That's not only about low wage workers. That is also that is also the issue of adjunct faculty. That is also the way in which white collar workforces have become uh, uh, increasingly contingent. And so, so, so to me, the um, I, I I like to say that I'm a part of a workers movement to, that that uh, and uh, to, uh, under which traditional um, collective bargaining is one part, but that I see the. The, the best work happening right now um, for empower, work empowerment in the world of, um, of, of national and local worker, worker centers. Um, and, and the last thing to say, just the, um, that, that one of the ways in which I think we are, um, where there's enormous potential, which again, um, everyone has, has hit on, is on, on rethinking how we bargain and why we bargain. Then that's, what, that's at the heart of bargaining for common good. That you know that when um, uh, at at local 26, when the because we were a union of that is overwhelmingly immigrant, overwhelmingly people of color, um, the like having community literally at the bargaining table with us felt very natural because uh, because in in a in a state like Minnesota where. Um, uh, where to be a person of color means that you are more likely to uh, to have worse educational outcomes, worse income, higher unemployment, et cetera. Like that, we knew that when we when we won a raise at the bargaining table, that money went back into communities and was invested into that those com those communities. Um, and so, uh, when it came to issues issues of racial justice, policing. Um, but also on issues having to do with climate change. And uh, we did a big green cleaning campaign in uh, 2009 and, um, and the union in this, their last negotiations after I stepped down, um, the youth climate strikers were, up, were literally at the bargaining table with, um, uh, with janitors um, and, and, uh, and putting it all on the line with the, the janitors when they, did, uh, when they had a one day strike. So um, to me, I find enormous hope in um, in the way in which many across the country are now thinking about bargaining differently. And I think bargaining for common good is not simply, it, it, is, it is about the moment of contract negotiations, but it's also about a perspective on power. Um, it's about saying that we understand that in today's world, when we are sitting across the bargaining table at, with when there is, you know, um, that six percent of the private sector workforce uh, um, that is uh, organized, when we are sitting across the table, we are not sitting across the table from the truly powerful. We're not sitting across the table from the financial sector, from those who are uh, too big to fail and too big to jail. Um, but when we form broader uh, um, bargaining uh, 
uh, teams, essentially, with community partners, that our goal is to like create a crisis for the wealthy and powerful to bring them to the table. And when we do that, we win bigger. And so that is, that is both about the literal moment of bargaining, but also just in the perspective of all the work that we do. Um, so, uh, so I just, I, I really appreciated your focus on, and, and, and on St. Paul um, Federation of Educators at that as an example, because I do think that that in terms of our, what is happening today in traditional collective bargaining, traditional trade unionism, it is the most exciting um, uh, uh, and hopeful thing that I think is, is, is out there. So. Thank you, Javi. I want to jump in, make one point, and then go back sure. to you, Steve. And sure, sure. One of the many things that Javier did not say that he could have said um, is that one of the non-traditional, amazing ways that SEIU 26 has operated is that when they secured their new offices in Northeast Minneapolis, it includes a theater. So when, when Javier talks about the importance and value of storytelling, here is a local union that decided to have a theater as part of their local offices with the marvelous name, the Strike Theater, uh, which is a, also a pun in the theater world. Um, and, uh, and so storytelling has really been at the heart of, of their work. And when I think about the work that AFSCME 3800 and St. Paul Federation of Educators have, have made in bringing other people to the table, bringing other people into the conversation and finding creative ways for members to build their, their confidence that their stories matter and that their jobs ought to reflect that their stories matter. Um, this is a really great set of experiences here. So go ahead, Steve, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thanks, Shireen. Thanks, uh, Javi, for your very smart uh, comments and questions. Um, so uh, first, you know, thanks for the kind words about storytelling. I remember uh, right around when my book came out, I heard, uh, I was listening to an interview with Alex Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and she was saying, it's so important for the movement to do storytelling. We got to do more storytelling. And I want to like shout through the radio and tell her, look at my book. You know, I, I try to do so much storytelling to really convey how difficult things are for uh, American workers nowadays. And, you know, I was just invited to speak um, through Zoom to the uh, Wisconsin AFL-CIO's labor convention. And, and I, I read one paragraph from my book to them. The very first paragraph of my book is about a worker in Milwaukee, which, and I think this one, unfortunate anecdote really tells how far too often, you know, American workers are just treated without basic dignity. And I write, throughout Mary Coleman's six years at a, as a cook at a Popeye's restaurant in Milwaukee, she remained stuck at the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. One afternoon, when she arrived for her shift after an hour-long bus commute, her manager told her to go home without even clocking in. Business was slow, he said, and she wasn't going to be paid at all for the day. Um, so, Shireen, about your comments on, on Taft-Hartley and worker militancy. Uh, I was looking at some, some graphs of union membership and union density, and you know, it was really rose very steadily from like, the time of the Flint State Death Strike 36 through 47, when uh, the Republicans pushed through the Taft-Hartley Act over President Truman's veto. And the act was very, very much aim to like chop unions off at the knees and to prevent them from growing. And it uh, enacted some, you know, steps to really make it, uh, you know, to, to really take away some of labor's uh, most successful weapons like the secondary boycott. And yes, worker militancy is very important, but I think, you know, there was so much militancy, labor militancy in 1946, the year after World War II ended, that it pissed off a lot of Americans. And that unfortunately uh, enabled, you know, the Republicans to push through Taft-Hartley because there was some anger at unions for, you know, pushing so hard. And I think one of the reasons we're seeing bargaining for common good is that a lot of unions realize, and certainly we've seen this with the teachers unions in West Virginia, Arizona, Los Angeles, Chicago, Oklahoma, they realize that, you know, um, 
for us to mount a successful strike, we can't do it in a way that alienates or angers the community. We have to do it in a way that brings the community to our side. So worker militancy is extremely important, I agree, but it's wiser yet to, to uh, engage in worker militancy with the, uh, you know, with the community at your side. Um, Janice, again, Shereen, you make a good point. Um, uh, you know, um, in my book, I explained that the Republicans, you know, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, uh, the passage of right to work laws in Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, the Janus decision uh, and the Janus lawsuit, which was funded by some, you know, billionaires, you know, I think they really want to weaken labor unions. And I think first and foremost, they're not so much trying to um, take away, I think, civil rights gains, such as they want to kill public sector unions because they see public sector unions as A, supporters of Democrats, B, folks who like public sector workers demand higher wages, and maybe more social workers and more teachers. And they say, oh, these unions suck. They're trying to create big government. And C, again, these billionaires and these conserv you know, and conservatives hate public sector unions because well, if teachers are paid higher salaries, if we have more nurses and librarians in schools, if we have smaller class sizes, that means we have to hire more people and that might raise the taxes of these poor billionaires. So I really think there has been a war. Uh, the Republicans have been mounting a war against public sector unions for years and years. I remember, I think it was 1996 when Bob Dole was running for you know, got the Republican nomination at the 96th Republican convention, he suddenly in the middle of his acceptance speech like declared war against teachers unions. And I thought, what's that about? And I think Republicans, you know, hate unions. They see them as supporting Democrats. They see them as uh, making life difficult for their big donors, corporate donors. They see, uh, you know, unions have a social democratic, social justice tradition. They want government to do more to provide Medicare or food stamps. And that upsets, you know, some Republicans who believe in, who hate, who hate uh, big government. Now, an unfortunate um, result of the Republican war against public sector unions and big government is that uh, workers of color have been hit disproportionately because a lot of African American workers, especially, have seen, you know, jobs in city government as uh, as a way to lift themselves into the middle class. Um, Javi, you're, I mean, you're right about traditional collective bargaining can only be one part. And that's especially true when private sector workers uh, now represent a 6.2% uh, of, uh, unions just represent 6.2% of, of uh, private sector workers. And we've seen, you know, corporate America take one step after another to reduce its responsibility to workers to, to reduce any loyalty it feels towards workers and to make it harder for workers to unionize. That's why they want to push all these workers into the independent contractor box rather than employee box, whether it's Uber or Lyft drivers or janitors or sometimes nurses or construction workers. That way they don't have to pay benefits. That way these workers can't unionize. That's another reason we're seeing this greater use of temp workers uh, and franchises workers. It's much harder to unionized franchise workers than regular workers. So corporate America really has it figured out, you know, these many, many ways to uh, weaken workers, to marginalize workers, to make them more precarious and make it harder for them to unionize. So, you know, Javi is right. Yes, worker centers are a very important and helpful way to lift workers, especially when it's grown so hard for many workers to unionize. A problem though, is that, you know, under the American legal system, you know, the National Labor Relations Act creates the one route avenue, you know, for workers to get together and win an official right to bargain collectively and force, you know, management to sit down at the table and then they could win some big gains. And it's, and, and the way, you know, and it's harder for worker centers, uh, you know, to force management to sit down. But Javi is, you know, exactly right. If worker centers or any worker groups or coalitions, uh, can you know not just deal with an employer or two, but try to deal with the banks behind the employer, or the politicians behind the employer, to to um, broaden out the fight. That can be very helpful to workers. Uh, Javi, I must confess, I'm not familiar with many great examples where that has happened outside the union context. Certainly, it happened with the teacher strikes. 
where the you know the strikes weren't a, you know against just the local school district, but were often against the governor and the uh, Republican-led led, led legislature, and against their years of you know huge tax cuts for the rich and corporations and starving the schools and not having enough money for teacher salaries and forcing up class sizes, and and that was kind of a, a wonderful case of workers confronting the state to, to try to build a fairer school system, a fairer economy, fair, you know, fairer society. And it was great to see, you know, during the uh, LA strike, the Chicago strike, the Arizona strike, the West Virginia strike, that there was so, so much uh, support for the teachers unions. And, and you know, I, and I, I write in detail about, uh, you know, some of these teacher strikes and how you know, these 23 year old teachers and 27 year old teachers were just fed up with you know the growing class sizes and and the years of pay freezes and and uh and you know they formed these facebook pages and, and thousands and tens of thousands of teachers signed up and it was an almost spontaneous spontaneous generation within a week or two or three tens of thousands of teachers in various states were ready to go on strike um, in my book i quote this young, you know, 25 year old uh, music teacher in, in um, just outside Phoenix. And he was Noah Carvelis, who had graduated from the University of Illinois two or three years before. And he was the guy who set up the Facebook that really got the ball rolling for the strike. And he said, uh, Facebook pages are great for mobilizing people, but they're not great for long term organizing. For that, he said, unions are vital. We need to make the union what it can be, we need to grow it and make sure it reflects what the people want. So I, I, I think all of the comments, you know, you know, we're all groping, you know, unions unfortunately have in many ways gotten weaker, but unions have recently gotten smarter with bargaining for the common good, with really trying to build big alliances, they're trying to work more with worker centers. But, um, you know, a big problem is, you know, corporate power is so vast in the United States. Uh, uh, they control a political party that uh, only wants to weaken and kill and cripple unions. So uh, it's great that there's all this fighting back by workers. It's great that many workers are so militant. Joe Biden, you know, one of the, you know, we, we've often, all of us have complained that, you know, for years the Democratic Party has forgotten its working class roots. Why doesn't it um, uh, work as closely, appeal as much to workers as, as, as it did under FDR? And we saw Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter and John Kerry just, you know, not be very, you know, not talk worker issues. And, you know, there was a big, big change in this year's Democratic campaign, whether it was, you know, Cory Booker or Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden or Pete Buttigieg, they all put out these amazingly good platforms on, 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 on worker issues. So it shows, I think the Democrats get it. They realize we need to, I was just listening to a terrific podcast with Bernie Sanders and Bernie was making this point that the Democrats has been stupid to turn their backs on workers for so many years. There's too many years they were uh, focused on getting corporate donations and, and, and you know, attracting upper middle class voters. And, and Bernie, and now I think we've seen a lot of the Democratic candidates say, um, if we're going to win, we have to appeal to those blue collar workers who turn to Trump. That if we're going to win Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, hey, we got to you know, work much harder to appeal to, you know, to these blue collar workers. And if we're serious about lifting wages and reducing income inequality, hey, we got to fight to increase the voice of workers, whether by making it easier to unionize or putting workers on corporate boards. And, and I think they get, and, and Biden, you know, and, and Biden gets this too, maybe not as emphatically as Bernie or Elizabeth Warren, but he gets that it's important to try to give workers a bigger voice and, and try to strengthen unions. So in many ways, despite the pandemic, you know, it is a promising time. So we're running short on time. Let me just try to get one more comment from, from everybody um, before we hopefully get some questions and comments coming in uh, on Facebook and, and YouTube. Um, Erica, you want to add anything, subtract anything? I think one thing that's um, striking me so much today and really deeply is, Stephen, you keep talking about corporate power. Um, and I think that there's such a huge connection to what's happening now with COVID and with educator unions. Um, so yesterday, 
um, Little Rock teachers refuse to go into their buildings. And this is, you know, what they consider to be an illegal strike. And now some of them, um, they really are risking termination for their jobs. But they're also being asked to risk their lives. I mean, this, this, and basically for corporate America, right? Like to, to reopen schools when we know it's not safe, when we know that disinvesting in public education for years has meant that our buildings don't have ventilation systems that are safe in terms of COVID, but they're being asked to reopen the schools so that our businesses can be up and running and we can reopen America. Um, and so I think that um, COVID is just amplifying the situation and creating even more of a pressure cooker. And I just, I, I heard, you know, just echoes of that throughout the book and throughout what you said today. And I think that that's really where I'm sitting now is just watching what's happening in my own local and in my own, you know, job as we worry about reopening and whether it's safe, but also standing in solidarity with educators and students and families across the country um, who have this concern. And so just how, how relevant um, and present that is. Just Thank a quick you. response. That's a great point, Erica. So, you know, we've seen Donald Trump, we've seen Betsy DeVos, we've seen Florida Governor Ron DeSantis say, everyone go back to school, everyone go back to school. And those effing teacher unions, they're so selfish, they're, they're, they're hesitating to go back to school. You and the public turn against the teachers unions. And I think, as you say, Erica, they're kind of using the strike to divide us and divide people against, you know, against the teachers. And that's very unfortunate. Thank you, Steve. Shireen? Yeah, I just think um, that uh, one of the things that, that comes to mind is that uh, corporations have been much more successful at shifting their model and their approach um, in order to respond to uh, workers organizing um, than unions have been and workers have been in changing or kind of strengthening our approaches in response to um, what the conditions are. And it, it, just thinking about COVID and, and on the one hand we have you know, workers who really have nothing left to lose. You're either going to go to work and die or you're going to walk off the job in order to stay alive, right? That, that makes it really clear, like, what the situation is. Um, and I think people are, are willing to take uh, the risk. Um, it, they're willing to take the risk on their job in order to not risk their lives. So there's a, a real, uh, you know, inspiration in that in a scary way, but a real inspiration. But then we also see the, you know, corporations talking about how the, you know, work from home environment in terms of office work, um, public sector job, like that it could just be outsourced, right? And that everyone who does office work suddenly becomes a, um, an independent contractor and that they can avoid all their labor costs. That, there was an article in, I think it was the Wall Street Journal uh, a month ago um, with uh, some corporate overlord, I can't remember who, advocating for that, saying this is a great opportunity that we have because people can work from anywhere. Um, and so I think we need to figure out as well um, how to, how to uh, do organizing in that context and how to how to maintain community and solidarity because i think that we live in a society that is largely based on um, individualism the exceptional individualism of the united states that um that people think i can do this on my own i don't need somebody else and the best of our organizing as a union is is in saying no we need to stick together so how do we do that when the the workforce becomes dispersed and how do we respond to that that's one of the things i've been thinking about a lot somewhat because i'm an office worker um and see what's coming so thanks shireen javier yeah <clears throat> i think in terms of corporate power, two two things that I that I think about a lot. One is something of uh, uh, my mentor in SCI, my first mentor in SEIU and the labor movement, um, Stephen Lerner, when said when said to me, and I, Shereen, you uh, um, said something similar earlier, that that if it's an effective tactic for worker empowerment, it is it either is or will be made illegal. Um, and uh, and I think it's an important just reminder to us all for uh, or, uh, organizers because I think that um, 
that does not mean we don't but that that is the very thing we have to push against right is like that 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 the fact that the rules are are as they are are precisely because corporations have figured out and this is the second thing i think about in terms of of corporate power that when we say we need to revive the labor movement corporations have already figured out a solution to the problem we present to them with a renewed labor movement that looks exactly like the old labor movement meaning that like that this they the contingent workforces and such like they have figured out all these ways of uh, of dissecting the work the workforce so that you can't gain power through uh traditional collective bargaining and again that to me, and I think looking internally, one of the problems the labor movement, I think of the last 50 years has had is this, that as we saw the rise of public sector unionism, we saw a sharp decline in private sector organizing. And, um, and we, you know, within SEIU, we'd, we'd have all these conversations about them. There were, the property services sector was in SEIU is the only 100% private sector. And I'd always be sort of screaming like, hey, we say we need to focus on private sector organizing, but when we make gubernatorial endorsements, we make those based on which governor can sign a law that will create more private sector uh, union members. Um, and I think the, the, the policy route has been an easier route because of the way that corporations have figured out a way, you know, the, 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 the contingent workforces. So to me, that's, that's the promise. Uh, like I see the worker center world today as incubators for what, a, what will be a renewed labor movement uh, worker movement uh, later later on because we need to figure out financial si sustainability and um, and such. But but it is to there it is to those spaces that contingent workforces can go to because uh, you know unions uh, I, I, I would say like we we need to until until the labor movement looks at the issue of temp agencies looks at looks at seasonal workforces looks at we need to figure out ways to organize the um and, and i think people are doing really fascinating uh, things through digital organizing get and and, and um uh at, at, a, at a scale never that, that we've never seen seen before and it gives me a, a lot of hope great steve do you have a last word of of wisdom or preferably? I, I will try. So thank you. First, this has been great. I thank everyone and thanks for your, your close read and smart comments. Um, you know, so when the National Labor Relations Act was enacted in 1935, as you labor historian Peter know, you know, it was a great step forward to empower workers in America. And for 10 or 15 years, 20 years, it really did wonders enabling workers to organize and win a greater share of their employers' profits and prosperity. Now, as Javi and, and Shereen Eric were saying, you know, it's much harder for unions to organize because corporations, you know, slice and dice workers and their workforces, you know, so they can't be defined as employees or they fight so hard or they fire workers. And, and you know, it's really hard to figure out how to move forward using the National Labor Relations Act. Yes, I'm all for more organizing, but corporations fight very hard. So I, that's why we're seeing these kind of, uh, uh, you know, these shortcuts to increase worker power, you know, you know, have go right to sectoral bargaining, even if only 10% of workers in a sector are unionized, or elect, you know, have corporate, you know, have workers elect 40% of people on the corporate boards, or, you know, let's adopt full scale German works council so that at every workplace, workers have a say, and that whether it's workers on corporate boards, or works councils, it will help give workers a bigger voice, it'll help embolden workers, and that might help, you know, create better balance in our, in our economy, and also maybe help embolden workers to, to take the next steps towards unionizing. But, uh, you know, what's happening now isn't working very well for unions, and I think, uh, you know, hopefully Mr. Biden will win, and hopefully the, you know, they'll uh, pass some laws that give workers greater voice and greater power, because you know, it, it, you know, that definitely ain't happening with Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. Okay. And thanks very much again, Peter, for doing this. Thank, thank you. So again, I, I want to thank Erica Schatzlein from St. Paul Federation of Educators and Shireen Horzuk from AFSCME 3800 and Javier Mario Alisea, formerly of SEIU 26 and now of Rutgers University and Steve Greenhouse, formerly of the New York Times now a reporter uh, unto the world. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's watching, uh, please 
uh, type in questions and comments. Uh, there is a lot more to say, uh, and hopefully some of our panelists will respond to your comments and questions, and hopefully the Eastside Freedom Library will continue to be a place um, that convenes these kinds of conversations and, um, and makes it possible uh, for us to continue to develop new ideas uh, to engage the world in which we're living. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you.